This is World of Reggae, live and direct here in Leicester, my hometown, with two people that have done so much to empower my knowledge of reggae music. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Roger Stephens from the United States and the UK's John Masuri to Leicester, to the Two Funky Music Cafe. Welcome on board. Oh, it's a great, great afternoon. One of the most beautiful days in England I've ever seen. Uh, Jaws shining his sun on us today. <laughs> yes, very, very grateful to be here. Nottingham's my hometown, so I feel it home in Leicester immediately. Thank you. Good. Now, you're here today, both of you, to um, give a talk, um, which is a series of a few more talks that are planned here in the UK on the oral history of Bob Marley. Tell the viewers a little bit more about what's brought together this combination or this union of two great writers together. Well, I think it began last fall when I came over from California to do a, a press tour for uh, the release of So Much Things to Say, the oral history of Bob Marley. And uh, John invited me down to the Comedia Club in uh, his home in Brighton. And we just basically sat on stage and, and talked about the things that we love best. and. Uh, people seem to really dig it. And John's son is a, a reggae promoter and as well as a, a well-known DJ. And uh, he said, oh, I could get you bookings. And he, he got us 15 bookings. And today is the opening day of the tour. And we are just so excited to be here with you and uh, hopefully all the people who are going to come out this afternoon to share their love of reggae with us and our love of reggae with them. I mean, reading through that book itself, you know, I was hooked from the very first p page that I turned. And it seems so much more than another book about Bob Marley because it sort of almost seemed as though a lot of these myths and rumors you know things you know things like for example the CIA involvements and things it's almost as though you're almost like this this quelling those rumors yeah you know quashing yeah. those rumors it's a myth busting book as as uh, John's work is too you know we uh, Chris Blackwell said at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that I was uh, more responsible for keeping the myth of Bob Marley alive than anybody and I really was upset by that because it's not a myth that we're talking about we're telling the truth you don't have to make up anything about Bob Marley he's bigger than life all by himself and uh, so that that was what that book set out to do and uh, right from the first page where we uh, talk about Bob's father and who he really was there there's myth busting going on all through it mm. why do you think that in the history of reggae music there is there are so many sort of like you know different myths and rumors that sort of like tend to sort of like spread out you know I mean like I've read so many of the different books and biographies about Bob Marley and his work and associated reggae artists and it's almost as though when you read one book and then read another one you can almost have two completely opposite stories why is that I think that's the power of uh, the artists and also the music because you find it in rock music as yeah. well you there are myths about the Rolling Stones there are myths about Bob Dylan it, it's a it, it's a a symbol of who's really great if their lives are of real importance and cultural importance you you are going to find myths with it uh, and they've lived such incredible lives and made such incredible contributions to our our understanding of the world we live in and and so there's bound to be that i think it comes with the territory and bob marley is definitely one of those few greats um that that's attracted that kind of uh, response and uh, and that kind of feeling well, a lot of it's up to the press because the old cliche is true uh, when it comes to printing the facts or printing the myth go with the myth <laughs> it sells more <laughs> it sells more and it, it makes our jobs easier because we have the facts yes and i think that's also one of the reasons that's held reggae back in the mainstream media is that they're not familiar with the stories and the myths, the urban myths if you like. This is why a lot of other reggae artists aren't as big as what they could be because we as fans and enthusiasts know the stories but they haven't crossed over to the mainstream yet. And, uh, you know, when I do my Life of Bob Marley multimedia show around the world, invariably the same questions are asked right to this day. Did the CIA kill Bob Marley? Did Bob Marley die from smoking too much pot? And, uh, you know, we should know better by now. And those, those things are repeated so often they become alternate facts, as some <laughs> despicable person said in 
Washington last year. And, and by the way, for all of you out there watching this right now, I humbly apologize on behalf of all the conscious people of America for the insidious government that we have. Please, please <laughs> forgive us. <laughs> Truck fump. <laughs> Can relate. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, I, you know, I was invited to do a reading of, of my book last November at the Library of Congress in Washington, and the city was covered in FT <laughs> graffiti. Uh, every corner had some something that that was written on. They don't like him back there. No. <laughs> but that changes the subject. <laughs> Going back to the book in question, so much things to say. Um, there's some really, really interesting interviews with two people that I don't think have really been documented in the history. Um, two of the original members of the Whalers, Beverly Kelso and Cherry Green. How did that come about and when did you record those interviews? That was agonizing to get those, you know. They, uh, they're on 30 tracks from the Coxon period and they've never made 10 cents in their lives and that material has never been out of print and they didn't want to talk to anybody they were so angry about the, their treatment but they were crucial figures Beverly and, and uh, uh, Cherry whose real name is Ermine Bramwell um, after 20 years of begging them writing to them calling them begging them some more they finally agreed in 2003 to sit down and let me do an interview with them uh, courtesy of a, a group of people you would love called the Midnight Ravers on the Pacifica left-wing uh, radio station in New York City, WBAI, and they flew um, Cherry Green, uh, Ermine, up from Florida, and uh, Beverly came down from the Bronx, and I did about nine hours with them, and uh, Cherry died shortly after that, so thank God their stories were finally told, and I think they uh, are, they're major voices in the book because they ha had been so ignored by so many people over the years, and it wasn't the fault of the writers, uh, they weren't talking to anybody, mm. so um, that, that was a major coup to be able to get their, their words. The point is that they hadn't spoken to anyone else, but they would talk to this man oh, because yeah. they know that his, his heart and his work is absolutely in the right place nice. with the right intentions. Mm. Thank you, Joe. Yes. <laughs> I'd also like to say that um, uh, my own series of books about the whalers couldn't have happened without Roger, someone I've known over 20 years, and uh, he, he is the oracle for, for, for this music. And so um, the first poet of call, if you're embarking on a project like that, is to Los Angeles, to Rogers. Roger. <laughs> As you can see, we have a mutual admiration society. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, while we're talking about some of the formative years of the Whalers, you've written an excellent book as well, Simmer Down, the, the, story, of the, the, early, the story of the early Whalers. And I picked up so much information. You know, I consider myself someone that's probably more knowledgeable than the average person on the street about the history of reggae music but I'm reading this book and thinking I didn't know that did that really happen how do you collect all this information uh, do you mean the the kind of cultural history and the social history and so on um, well I've been interviewing people for over 30 years um, in, in the Jamaican music industry and um, I grew up amongst Caribbean people and so I was the first generation to go to school with Jamaican people so uh, they used to come and sit in the next desk and say they were from you know Harbour View or something so uh, it's an accumulation um, and also what fascinates me is not just the music it's the people's lives and how they form as individuals it's what goes into that creativity um, so it's not just the song it's not just the albums it's the life force that thinks of those mm. things and and conceives of the, that music and everything that goes into it what shapes that creative mind that brings us this wonderful music so uh, that's always been a very key 
core interests of mine. And what I love about John's books is he deconstructs the music so perfectly. Eh? In, in Simmer Down, it's the whole Coxon catalog, and he talks about every single song. And one of the greatest books uh, out of four or five hundred that exist on Bob Marley is Wailing Blues, the story of Bob Marley's Wailers. It's really the autobiography of family man Barrett, and every song that they ever recorded from uh, Judge, not Judge Not, from what? Well, from my cup, from my cup, 1970 forward, is in that book, and uh, it it is a peerless work of of study and and art. I just I love that book. I mean, it's poignant now because Family Man is is quite ill uh, and quite aged now. And the last time I saw him, which was just a few months ago, I realised that that story couldn't be told anymore. anymore. Um, so thank God that, um, you know, we happened to tell the story while he was still capable of recalling all of those things. And uh, so I, f I feel very um, blessed to have been in that position um, to do that for him. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I saw um, the Whalers here in Leicester about two months ago, and I was quite taken aback by the fact that, you know, he was needing to be assisted in a wheelchair and, you know, almost like a much smaller figure of his, his, his original self, yes. you know, and it is quite sad that, you know, you know, sadly, we are sort of in that generation where we are losing a lot of our pioneers in the history of music. And there's so many stories that are still untold. So, you know, we give thanks that, you know, people like yourselves are out there actually sharing the truth. And not and not not the rumors and things as yeah. well, you know, that you can often see on, especially nowadays in the world of the big wide web, there's, there's so many rumors out there. Yeah. And not in world of reggae, though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, 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 no. Now, you've just um, touched, Roger, on the fact that you did some of those interviews back in 2003. That leads me to believe that the collection of, I think, over 70 different interviews within this new book must have been done over a longer period of time. I've been into reggae for 45 years. I've been interviewing, beginning with Peter Tosh, followed by Bob Marley, my first two interviews in 1979. So that's 38 years, I guess. Um, and the book took 15 years. Wow. From the time I signed the contract in 2002 to the publication last summer in 2017 and um, I'll talk about that today because it involved a computer crash that took all my work. What the book represents is 75 people talking to me about their life with Bob Marley, people who knew him when he was three years old in the village and uh, I wanted a book that told Bob Marley's story in the words of the Jamaican people. Okay. You know, uh, not some Timothy White make up a bunch of conversations in bed with Rita and Bob that he had no idea what they were saying at the time. Uh, it's, a, it's a counterweight to, to that kind of fictionalized version of, of the story that has often been the form writers have taken. Mm -hmm. I wanted Jamaicans to tell their own story. Yeah. And you also managed to talk to a certain Carl Colby. Assassin Carl Colby. Assassin Carl Colby. Now, May lightning uh, how, strike you on the spot, Shrek. Uh, how, how do you manage to talk to somebody like that so many years oh, after the, oh, this, the alleged event? This is one of the best stories of all because, you know, uh, for years people have been accusing this poor guy of, of killing Bob Marley or trying to kill Bob Marley and nobody ever talked to him. And I found him in the Beverly Hills phone book. You found him in the Beverly Hills <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And I called him up and I said, hey, w would you do an interview with me about uh, your time with Bob Marley? And he said, yeah, you think people would be interested in that? I said, oh, yes, Mr. Colby, they would be. And I, I, I filmed him uh, as I, I presented him with magazine articles saying that he had gone to Jamaica with the intention of murdering Bob Marley and hired a bunch of killers to go and, and shoot at him. And the poor guy was just completely flabbergasted. He had never heard any of this stuff. And it had been going on for years yes. and years. And, and, you know, he just spilled his heart out to me. So I, I loved Bob Marley. I wasn't too crazy about my father, who was the head of the CIA, but I loved Bob. And, and you know, why would I want to kill Bob Marley? This is absurd. And he spelled out the whole uh, experience of going to Jamaica. He landed the night Bob was shot. 
Right. Okay. You know, he hear, he hears about it on the way to the hotel from the airport. Uh, he didn't show up like Marlon James, fictionalized in Seven Killings, weeks in weeks. advance, going and getting a bunch of thugs to to shoot Bob. So um, I think that's a major part of the book: the fact that there's four chapters devoted to the assassination attempt, and there's one whole chapter with with Carl Colby Jr. And uh, it speaks for itself. He makes a very convincing case that he had nothing to do with it. I think case closed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, we could talk for so you know about so many different things. You know, I'm thinking of obviously like your your archive. I mean, how many rooms does it cover now? Seven. Seven. Well, the whole downstairs, floor to ceiling, seven rooms of uh, 45 years of obsession. I mean, uh, I read that article in Rolling Stone, and um, I, I put it in an envelope, um, and that was the first file in what became Roger Steffen's reggae archives. It's absurd how much there is. I've had to move twice just to house the collection. Wow. <laughs> and you met my wife today. She's the world's most patient, patient. woman. <laughs> What's the plan with the archive? Obviously, I know that, you know, over the years, you know, we've had talk that you would like the archive to go to Jamaica, where it is housed in a public museum. Is that still your intention? Absolutely. I, I will not relinquish my hold on life until I've accomplished that and uh, currently things are looking very good for, for that to happen mm. I can't talk about anything publicly yet but it, uh, it's, it's looked better now than it has in a long time mm. I don't want it broken up that's that's been a, st a stumbling block for a lot of people you cannot break up the collection and it must be made available to the public while respecting all the artist rights and until I find someone willing to do that there's no money on earth that is going to pry it out of my hands I'll just say at this point, Shriek, uh, what's happening with Roger's archive has um, has ramifications for the whole of the reggae uh, world, as far as I'm concerned, because there are a lot of uh, collectors and um, uh, a, a lot of people who gathered a lot of material, whether, uh, whether it's an archive of things they bought or, or created, and they're reaching an age now where they're thinking, what's going to happen to it? when I'm no longer here and there is nowhere to place it there there is no one place where these things can go and so if Roger's archive which is which is the mother load in a sense mm. finds a home a good home which will make it available to people and to people to study and so on then it gives hope to other people who've also amassed various parts of reggae history to to think that yes this could be the beginning of a, a national archive or an international archive it's very important the next step mm. so I know that time is short today I have one last question for you okay. okay what period in Bob Marley's life do you think he was the happiest from your own experiences oh, that's a good question isn't it I don't know if he was ever truly happy, he, because he was unsatisfied with the way of the world. And he wanted a better place for all peoples. And the more he traveled around the world, I think the more oppression he saw, and, and the more need for the message music he was making. Um, I wonder if Bob would describe himself as a happy person. What do you think, John? Well, he had a reputation for being a screw face, Roger. Yeah. So maybe not. But I remember asking a similar question to Family Man, and he thought that Bob truly loved Cindy Breakspear. Okay. And during their early times together, um, if I had to make an educated guess, I, I would probably guess. And, and yet that theory. coincided with the discovery of the cancer. So <laughs> that's a double-edged sword. Absolutely. Mm. And she was feeding him liver to make him stronger. stronger. Yeah. But what a what a, a wonderful legacy he's he's left to the world, and they'll be playing his songs as long as there are human beings on this planet. He's the most important musical artist of the second half of the 20th century, without question. And that's not just my opinion. That was the opinion of the New York Times at the millennium, and I agree with them. And congratulations to you for all the work you've done to keep the music alive and to present the positive picture of, of the community of reggae and uh, the message that it carries. And may you uh, thrive for a long, long time to come. 
while there's still good music being made, we'll carry on doing what we're doing. Yeah, That's right. all I can say, you know. Roger, John, I really appreciate your time today and we give thanks for everything that you've done for the music itself over these years. I'm not going to embarrass you by saying how many years, but, you know, you've both really taught me so much about reggae music and, you know, given me a, a, almost like a passion to actually delve deeper and deeper into it. And once you've delved deeper into it, you can't get out. Mission accomplished. Well, then our work is done. <laughs> One love, brother. One love. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.